Right, we are now live. Hello, and welcome to the Finance and Claims Committee meeting for today, Thursday, April 8th, 2021, starting the meeting at 7.04 p.m. And I will start the, um, start the meeting with the roll call of committee members um, starting with Council Member David Hooverman. Present. Council Member Tom Keegan. Here. Council Member Nick Saccinelli. Present. Council Member Diana Revolus. Here. Council Member John Kites. Here. Um, and Council Member Greg Burnett. So we have a quorum for the meeting. Thank you. Uh, the next item is. Uh, before we move into public participation, as it relates to the agenda, we do have three items that came in um, um, recently to add to the agenda. Um, the first item is approval of the fiscal year 2021 parking authority budget. The Second item is approval of the fiscal year 2021-2022 WPCA budget. And the third item is the appointment of auditors to audit fiscal year 2020 through 2021. Um, do I have a motion to add these three items to the agenda? Council member uh, Keegan, thank you. Um, are you ready for the question? All those in favor, show, uh, show by raising your, of your hand. Okay, it's unanimous, thank you. So those three items will be added as item 12, 13, and 14 um, to the agenda. Moving on to um, public participation. No emails were sent in Jeff, do we have anyone that has their hand raised from the public that wishes to speak? No, we do not. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Uh, are there any uh, committee members that have any items that they wish to add or received any emails? Okay, hearing, seeing none, we'll close public participation and move to item four, which is approval of the minutes of the Finance Committee meeting dated March 11th, 2021, the regular meeting. Do we have a motion on the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Council uh, Member Hooverman. Do we have any corrections? Yes. Yes, uh, Chairman Burnett. Um, on page four of the minutes, where the bolded area where it says Mr. Hooverman moved to authorize um, that should also have be item number eight from that agenda. So we're missing the eight to uh, and that uh, agenda item number. And on page five, the same thing in the bolded area at the bottom where it says Mr. Keegan moved to authorize should be item number 10 from that agenda. Okay, very good. Um, and that's all I had. Thank you. Um, I did have one item. I'm going to share my screen and bring up the agenda. And uh, uh, yes, uh, Lisa. I had a couple of corrections to your minutes, I think. Um, on page four, where it says it was listed under tax collectors reports. It says this is a tax sale year and that I explained that they are hampered by collection enforcement this year. I don't think that's quite what I said. I, I think I might've said that collection enforcement is hampered this year because of the extended grace period. Um, and then there was one other correction beneath the bold type where it spoke on Councilman Huvelman. It said, she said this is a billing change for the state of Connecticut's CPACE. It should be CPACE program. And that was on page, what page was that? On page four, both of them. Four. Right here. 
I think you just went by it. Yeah. Okay. Where it says CPACE, it should be CPACE program. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And also on this page um, where the sentence says, um, the tax sale within the last three weeks, it should say not, it should be, it, 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 it is planned for August 16th, not just I. So that's the only update that I had. With those corrections, um, I'll call for a hand vote. Um, all those in favor of approving the minutes with the necessary corrections, please indicate by raising your hand. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, moving on to now items five, six, and seven, which is the claims committee report, followed by the narrative and the monthly tax collector's report. Lisa? And I'll- um, Okay, great. I'll bring up the uh, narrative. Okay, thank you and good evening. The claims report for this month um, is a regular report without a vote being necessary because there is nothing in excess of $10,000 to be done. So that is for informational purposes only um, with the claims report. Through the month of March, I'll move along to the spreadsheet and to the narrative. We are at 97.72% of our levy, which is down less than a quarter of 1% from where we were the prior year, 2020. Um, it's really right where we had hoped to be. Um, as you know, last year in March was when the bottom dropped out of everything due to COVID. So we're now sort of comparing apples to apples, whereas before we were comparing apples to oranges. The difference being, of course, this year we have the extended grace period. So March 31st was not really the end of our collection cycle, rather April 1st was. So, um, but we're, where we need to be in terms of collection relative to our levy, um, in terms of what they budgeted for us to collect. So that's all very good news. We collected net in excess of $2.6 million in delinquent taxes through the end of March during this fiscal year. Um, still down a little bit from last year, but climbing. And with regards to the tax sale, we have 104 accounts that are paid in full. Those were the accounts we started working on pursuing in November of 2019. We sent out a series of letters on April 1st to 87 properties that were still remaining in the sale, reminding them that the sale is coming. We're going to revisit the list because we have only about $2 million, just over $2 million left. That's what those 87 properties represent. Um, 4.1 million has come in already, which is, is good. Um, but we are going to really be working on the sale in earnest now that the springtime is here and now that our collection cycle is over. Um, the cycle ended without fanfare on April 1st. What we're doing now is we are trying to get caught up with enforcement. So we have a file of delinquent notices that are at our printers now. They'll be going out within the next week to 10 days. Um, and just so that you're familiar, we use a statutory term when we send a delinquent notice, it's called a demand notice. This is a statutory term. It's required by law that the tax collector makes demand for payment. It's not meant to imply rudeness in any way. It's a, a term that is required for us to use that enables us to do everything else that we need to do, like file lien continuing certificates, issue warrants and things of that nature. We have to make demand first. So the notices that go out are called demand for payment notices, um, but it's not meant to upset anybody. And we explain that on notice. Um, those, like I said, those are going out now. They normally would have gone out in February. So we're a little bit behind. We'll be filing lien continuing certificates at the end of this month. Normally we would have filed them by St. Patrick's day. So we're playing catch up. Um, our office is still open to the public. We're open from nine to three. 
everything is working out fine. Um, starting next week, our staff will be back working on site um, five days a week without working from home any longer because we're finding that we need to have them there to, to keep up with our work. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions that you have, but considering where we are and considering COVID and everything, I think we're actually doing pretty well. Thank you, Lisa. Let me just flip this around. Are there any, let me stop sharing so I can see. Are there any questions? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree. I think we are in fairly good condition com compared to last year, if my math is correct. Um, this time last year, we were about $7 million away from making the, the, the update, the chain, the levy amount of 333 million. And this year right now, we're 8 million away from making the levy at 351 million. So all things considered, we're in a fairly good position compared to last year, which was, you know, pre-COVID. Yeah, it was right in the middle of COVID because COVID right. shut us down on the 13th of March. Right. That's, that's when it happened, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're doing okay. Once we send the delinquent notices out, I think that we will get another influx of payments um, because that's when everything sort of gets sorted out. So we'll know, we'll know more later this month. We'll get more in later this month. Everything else that we normally do, we're doing, like we're, we're tracking health permits and building permits and things like that. We've done a wage garnishment. So all our regular enforcement activities are still going on. The, the only thing that we really had to put off was the tax sale, and that was because the state told us to. So now that the restrictions on the sale are lifted, we're, we're pursuing that as well. Great. Greg, there's another schedule Lisa has prepared for me weekly since last March 1st went the onset of COVID. And right now the latest I have is 57 weeks, which goes through April 3rd this year versus April 4th last year. So for those 57 weeks, we are up 16.2 million versus last year. So it just corroborates on a, on a strictly cash flow point of view. We're collecting more, but each year the net tax levy is a little bit larger. So just on a cash basis, the money is coming in. Knock on wood, we finally now can compare because we had another 60-day extended grace period. Um, but uh, without jinxing anything, we think we're, we're okay for where we are for this fiscal year. And any early indications whether we'll have another grace period come July as we did last summer? That's, that's the million dollar question. Nobody's talking. <laughs> it, and the sad part is with the second half, with the second installment, they told us it wasn't gonna happen and then they did it anyway. So I, I don't know what to think. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wait patiently. <laughs> we'll wait patiently, exactly. Very good. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, items five, six, and seven are all for informational purposes only. Great. Thank That's you correct. very much. Okay. Thank you, folks. Moving on to item eight, which is to receive the Oak Hills Authority monthly financial statement for February, 21, February 2021. Sorry. Um, And we have uh, Joe Androsco, who is the treasurer on to uh, take us through the uh, monthly update. Hello, Joe. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, continuing the theme from last month um, at which I reported uh, the preliminary February financials were going to be uh, net income negative, which is um, typical for 
uh, a golf course in the Northeast in February where we're keeping up salary and not, we were actually shut down with zero revenue rounds, um, with zero golf rounds played in February due to snow cover. Um, so, you know, that's, that's effectively what ended up <clears throat> panning out for February. The preliminary financials were close to the reported financials. March is trending a little bit better, but as has already been referenced, um, um, there's a, a bad comp there year over year where last year, March, we shut down the course on March 16th um, and effectively had no revenue coming in for half a month. Um, and it's the better half of the month, right? It only gets nicer at um, end of March versus um, early March. And so the comps are not so great. As such, our, our financials look great uh, comping year over year for March so far. Not to get too deep into the details, but last year was about a net income negative of 40,000. Um, this year is trending to be like more like a net income negative of 10,000. We're still not generating a ton of rounds and we still have a lot of overhead um, with um, uh, work to be done to get the course up into spring shape. So, you know, there is usually a disconnect in March um, and we've really narrowed that gap so far. Um, in terms of rounds, um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about budget for the fiscal year 21, which ends in June this year um, versus actuals. Um, and really the note that I wanna say is we're about 30% over budget um, for overall rounds played, um, which is fantastic. I, and, you know, not knowing exactly what to expect due to uncertainty related to COVID, we did have a relatively um, conservative expectation for rounds, which drives our revenue expectations for fiscal year 21. Um, we just think that that's the right approach to take, um, not to, you know, kind of pretend as though we have revenue in hand um, when we really did not know what. Um, 2021, uh, the early part of well, the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 was going to bring. So um, it's it's been very good versus budget, um, and you know I'll I'll reference that because one of the things that we've done and we've done it a little bit earlier than we have in um, any prior year is to deliver a draft budget to the city, um, which um, we I think we got it over in early March. Um, it's a preliminary budget, it's high level assumptions, but uh, I touched upon this last month on, at the meeting on the 11th. It does put us in a much better financial position with relatively um, high rounds totals, although they're conservative with comparison to um, conservative with comparison to how we're trending fiscal year 21 so far. So for fiscal year 22, we're not really expecting a big increase versus actual. So we think it's a relatively reasonable expectation um, uh, of about um, a little under 10% growth in rounds versus the, um, the what we're seeing um, so far fiscal year 21. And um, we were, you know, we kind of, locked our preliminary expense expectations to kind of the prior three years highs. So what we think we're doing is taking a relatively reasonable approach on revenue and a fairly conservative approach on operational expense, um, which includes salary, you know, kind of keeping the course up, up uh, and running and keeping the course beautiful uh, and the park beautiful. Um, so we're taking a relatively conservative approach there. Overall, our net, op by the way, this is, I don't know, uh, Mr. Burnett, if you're um, able to share, but this is page 29 of the agenda for anyone who's who's following along. Uh, sure. It's the summary P&L of our um, preliminary 22 budget. Um, overall, our net operating income is 240 uh, positive with debt that we owe to the city and other debt that we owe to commercial lenders, um, that drops it down to about 90, 92 and a half thousand. Is this and we expect more, to, um, Yes, exactly, yes. So in that kind of purplish number, the, the net operating income down towards the bottom of the screen, that's the 240 positive net operating income. Cash and debt bring us down by about 150 to about a $90,000 um, cash affected number. 
which we intend to put back directly into capital project expenses. Some of this may be to build a capital reserve and some of it may be for particular capital expenses. As a preliminary budget, we don't have all of that identified just yet, but this is a pretty reasonable expectation of what our budget for um, the final budget for fiscal year 22 will be. So with that, I'm happy to answer your, oh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't note that at our um, uh, regularly scheduled meeting in March and a special meeting scheduled shortly thereafter, um, we did um, approve and authorize um, contracts for um, food services and a contract, an employment contract for a new position, uh, which is kind of an old position as well. It's, it, we didn't have one for a couple of years. And we think that the operating model will be better with a general manager position to kind of coordinate across the pillars of the course to get the golf right, to get the, um, the, um, the operations and the, 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 um, the groundskeeping uh, all kind of coordinated along with the finances. Um, so I definitely wanted to mention those two items as well, but happy to take any questions now. The, uh, Joe, the new vendor, uh, when will they be operational? So, uh, yeah, they expect to be operational in the main restaurant uh, June 1st and sometime earlier than that, probably more like May 1st um, at the halfway house. Um, there were a couple of uh, curveballs that were thrown uh, when we actually got back into the restaurant building and, and you know, had a professional come look at it. Um, and identify a couple of things that really needed to be done before they were um, back up to code. Great, thank you. Any questions for Oak Hills? Uh, Mr. Hey. Chairman, this is John Kite. Is have a quick question? Yes. Um, hey, Joe, when's that contract coming to uh, the council for approval? The... Well, we didn't know it was uh, required to be put for approval. We distributed to, uh, I think, a, a select group. Uh, we brought it to the chair, Mr. Burnett. I think you were copied on it, and a couple of other council members were on it. Um, we can we can always bring it for approval. I will note that it's already been authorized by the authority and executed, so it's actually a signed. Okay, man. I don't mean I don't mean I don't want to be a stickler for detail, but I do believe. Um, and I'm and I'm and I've heard and I've seen it and I and I and I and I there's a lot of it I approve of and to be honest there's nothing I um, that, that catches my eye that I disapprove of but I do believe that it did require council approval. Um, I mean I don't know Mr. Chairman uh, maybe you're a little bit more familiar with the specifics on what we approved a few years back but um, just out of curiosity I, I do believe that's that was the case. To what extent council approval I, I would just assume that it would have been. Uh, committee and then full council, but I may be mistaken. Not that anybody can give me some clarification on that. The the contract that was sent uh, sent out did not include the name of the vendor. It was a con somewhat of a blanket contract. Um, names and and several several of the items were were not included, so it was more verbiage than anything else. So if there's an actual contract that includes the name of the vendor and all the terms and conditions, Joe, we have not received that as of this, this meeting. Yeah, correct. We distributed the contract that we had at the time, uh, which did not have the vendor name specifically written into it, mostly because the vendor name was not known at the time that we were going to authorize. Uh, but it was really for to uh, have the, com the this committee and, and members of the council um, get an understanding of the structure of the contract and what the stipulations of the contract would be. Um, this is my ignorance and I apologize for that. I am not aware of any requirement that's documented for the common council or a committee of the common council to approve a contract in advance. Um, it's not in our charter, it's not in any of the loan agreements. It's So I, I've, I've, after, uh, Mr. Kites, you brought that up at last meeting. I did pour through some of the documents and not a lawyer, but I, I was not able to find reference to it. If it's a understanding or a convention, um, this is this is something that we we missed. We 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 did make our best efforts to 
make the committee and the council aware of it. But if we failed there, um, we'll do what we need to do to rectify it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry, Mr. Chairman, if you're about to speak, but I just, yeah, I mean, I do remember during, um, and, and where it would be included, I do not know, but uh, and Mr. Burnett, I believe you were involved in these conversations uh, that perhaps several years, uh, maybe my memory is serving me correctly, but I do, I do, like I said, believe that there was language included in something or that would that would require any leasing of that building to go through the council for approval, but so be it if, if it's not there. But perhaps maybe if that is the case, then perhaps we can see the finalized document uh, at some point just to get eyes on it. Thank you. Joe, we'll take that as a follow up after this meeting and okay. uh, touch base with the uh, legal department to see what approvals, if any, need to be take place. And um, so we'll huddle on that. Okay, let me know how I can help. Yep, great. Thank you. Any other questions for Oak Hills? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, for the update. We'll move on now to item number nine, which is reads the following. Authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to submit an application to the state of Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection Division for Emergency Management and Homeland Security Grant for the Emergency Management Performance Grant, which is approximately $65,000. Do we have a motion on this item? Uh, Council Member Hooverman, thank you. And we have with us uh, Albert Bassett, who is the Assistant Fire Chief, to um, uh, bring us up to date on this uh, request. Yes, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, the, the Hazmat Teams grant. Um, NOAC's been the fiduciary for the last four years. Um, as the, I sent out in the uh, letter for the last few years that we are mutual aid agreement and we need a, one of the municipalities to uh, handle the, uh, the finances through, uh, you know, the finance department and, uh, and purchasing authority through that. So as since, you know, working in Norwalk, um, we've taken that role for the last four years for the regional team. And I'm just asking for that permission again, if we can continue uh, with that fiduciary responsibility. Any questions? What's our administrative fee, Al? Uh, we do not, I do not take the administrative fee because I don't think we meet the, uh, the, um, the training requirements for that 1500. Um, so we don't officially take the, I'll leave it at, we don't officially take the administrative fee. Maybe you shouldn't volunteer so quickly in the future. That's all. I, I looked into the ministry. I mean, we, we would have to do a little training with the with the people at City Hall. I mean, if we really want the 1500 officially, uh, we can do that. That's not a problem. Uh, we could provide that training. Uh, but I we've um, we've taken it that, you know, we've done the work and and not taken the money for it as a, uh, you know, as a city. We're here to serve and support all of our departments and I'll speak on behalf of the controller, uh, you owe her one. They're doing a great job. <laughs> Any other questions on this grant request? Okay, um, we'll conduct a roll call vote on this item. Uh, Council Member Hoogman. Aye. Council Member Keegan. Yes. Council Member Saccinelli. Council Member Saccinelli. <laughs> Hello. I can't. I can't unmute for some reason. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now we can. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, Council Member Revolus. Uh, yeah. All right. Council Member Kaitis. Council Member Kaitis.
Uh, well, Council Member Burnett is a yes. Uh, Council Member Kai uh, John, can you hear us? I apologize. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Is that a yes? Yes. Sorry. Right, thank you. And 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 myself is a yes, so it's unanimous. So this item is approved, and we'll we'll take move it forward to the next council meeting, which is Tuesday, April thirteenth. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number 10, which is reads as follows, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to submit an application to the state of Connecticut for grant funds provided under the state of Connecticut's local capital improvement fund for local capital improvement program. The amount is $652,435 dollars, which is the 2021 entitlement. Do we have a motion on this item? Yeah, uh, Council Member Keegan, thank you. And we have with us for Vanessa uh, Valderas, who is the principal um, uh, engineer to uh, take us through the, the low separate requests. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we are here just to ask you to authorize us to submit the application for the slot SIP grant. This fund is providing exclusively for paving. Um, so I just want to, um, this one is for about $652,000. Um, this just kind of help us out um, with some of our paving program that I know you guys are very familiar with it. Um, I just want to give you an idea about last year's paving. Um, we had about $3.75 million spent just on paving. We were able to pave um, above 10 miles of center lanes, uh, what was 30% more than we did the previous year. Um, also, as part of our paving, uh, we also take care of all the sidewalks on the streets that we're going to get paved and also uh, curbs. So... On that, we have a separate budget line that it is close to $2 million. Um, last year was a little bit less, but for this coming year, it will be about $2 million. And last year, we were able to do a total of 12,000 linear foot of uh, new sidewalk. Um, that was 100% more than we did in the previous year. Um, so I just want to share some of the numbers of what we do with part of this grant. Again, this is really doesn't uh, support all our program, but definitely helps some of it. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? I know this is uh, last year, we received um, around 647,000. So this is a little bit more this year. I guess that's a good thing. Yes, but the number is kind of, it is about the same. Um, so that kind of the state comes up with the number. If you see the list, each, each town has its own. Um, the good thing is why this money keep coming is that we spend it. So um, usually if you spend the money, you get more. If, if you don't have a strong paving program in place um, that you are not able to use the money, usually you don't see that funding coming. So um, we have this, for many, many years already in place. Great, thank you. Um, seeing no further comments or questions, um, roll call vote on this item. Uh, Council Member Hooverman. Aye. Council Member Keegan. In uh, New York. Uh, Council, Council Member Saccinelli. Aye. Bear with me Council one Member Revolus. Aye. Council Member Kaides. Yes. And Council Member Burnett is a yes. So this item is approved and it will we'll move it to the council meeting for next Tuesday, April 13th for full council approval. Thank you so much and have a good night. Good night, thank you. Uh, moving on to item number 11, which is off, reads as follows. Authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling to approve the library infrastructure changes, purchase, delivery and training for the staff for two laptop vending kiosks for an amount not to exceed $70,000, budgeted capital expense account noted, no special appropriation required. Do we have a motion on this item? 
Council Member Leverloose, thank you. And we have with us Laura Iflin. I hope I pronounced it correctly. You did. Director of Technical Services to uh, take us through this item. Sure. Um, about a year ago, I was noticing that people were starting to use our resources at the library very differently. And I was hoping to offer them an easy way to use our technology. We're noticing that people are coming to the library a lot more often for job interviews and to do study groups where they need to have machines that can go into private rooms and such. These laptop vending machines will allow us to house six machines at each library, six at the main branch and six at the Sono branch. And it will also make it easier for us to keep them up to date to make sure that the patron security, um, you know, all their data is erased when they put the machine back. So we don't have to worry about that, that the, um, the machines themselves are kept up to date and all they would have to do is scan their library barcode to borrow it. They keep it in the library and use it for whatever purposes they need to do to help them participate in the digital world. Uh, one question I had in, in, you know, in our current COVID environment, um, how, how, how are we sanitizing the, um, the uh, IT equipment uh, once someone uses it and puts it back into the, 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 the dock, docking station? Sure. The vendor that we are using actually has installed a little piece of software on the machine that alerts the librarian that a machine has been returned and it cannot be borrowed again until we okay it. We will take the machine out. We will sanitize it using best practices, which is basically right now at about 70% isopropyl alcohol wipe, wiping down. And then we can put it back in and we clear it for checkout again. Yes, uh, David. Uh, thank you, Chairman Burnett. Um, real quick, uh, what um, are there ongoing continuing costs with this uh, through this vendor? I mean, I see a $70,000 initial uh, amount right. to get these kiosks in, but what are the year to year costs with this? Sure, um, the annual hardware service agreement for both um, is going to be $2,511, and that's going to come out of the um, library budget. And um, that um, actually is used for upgrading. Part of the money is for the software upgrades, you know, every year. But for the actual hard grade, hardware, so that when this becomes obsolete or they have the newest, better model, we use part of that money as down payment towards the newer ones. So we'll never have to outlay the full amount again. Okay, so ultimately, we sort of it's an an ownership lease type agreement with uh, with the the equipment. Is that how that works? Right. We can decide to say we don't want to use this vending machine anymore. We want to have the laptops out in the open or just in something like that. So we own the machine out. We are buying it outright. Okay. And another question is, how is uh, security handled with these units uh, uh, interfacing into our network or anything like that? Sure. Um, I, um, I'm working very closely with Anthony, Jeff, and Rodney. They are going to do all of that security, making um, it, all it has to do is access our circulation system to authenticate their library barcode. As long as they have a library card in good standing, it will allow them to borrow it. It will not be on our network to do any sort of printing. We're installing wireless printing, which um, Jeff is setting up a, a virtual environment that it can go through. So that's the only access to our network. And, and that will be, sorry. Are these, do these computers then have limits as to what they can be used for? Are there, um, uh, ways of monitoring, you know, uh, website usage, that type of thing, or are they just free and open once a person grabs them? No, they're free and open just as our desktop, our public desktops are. Um, they are unfiltered. Um, they, they can um, download. We can, um, we're putting a product on it called Smart Shield, which will kind of reset them once they're restarted. So any uh, malicious 
software that they download or anything that they can do will then be erased once once the computer is rebooted. We're um, also I was uh, recommended by Anthony to look into a couple different um, security for the actual so they don't walk out of the building and I'm looking at two very different um, pieces of equipment. One is a um, it's basically a tattoo that if they try to take off the sticker underneath it, it says this is a stolen property from Norwalk Public Library, which um, the company says it's it's a great deterrent to resale and to theft. Because um, what we want is the machine back, so it's it's labeled to us. So hopefully, there's a good Samaritan. The other um, uh, software that I'm looking into um, has GPS tracking, real time GPS tracking, so that we can get they they say within a hundred feet of where the machine actually is. Um, they also allow us to access the camera, so we can actually see who is using it. Or we can send a little message to the desktop saying, you know, it's time to return the, the laptop. Um, you've left the building and we're going to start, you know, hunting it down kind of thing. I haven't decided which way the best way to go. I'm looking for really the advice of the IT committee at the city for, for um, decisions. Great. Well, I, I think this is a great, uh, a great offering for the library. And oh, uh, I'm glad, great. I'm glad you guys are doing it. So thank great. you. Thank you. Any any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing seeing none. Uh, Council Member Hooverman. Aye. Council Member Keegan. Yes. Council Member Satchinelli. Aye. Council Member Revolus. Aye. Council Member Kaides. Yes. Council Member Burnett is a yes, so it's unanimous. So, uh, Laurie, we will take this forward for our full council approval next Tuesday, April 13th at the Common Council meeting. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Have a lovely evening. Great. Thank you. Moving along to the next item, which is approval of fiscal year 2021-2022 Hawking Authority budget. Do we have a motion on this item? Our council member Revolus, thank you. And we have with us Jessica Vanashek, saying it right for the first time, uh, Chief of it. Economic and Community Development to walk us through the um, Parking Authority budget. Great, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, so presenting the FY. I'm sorry, do you need me to bring it up on the screen? You're more than welcome to, that's fine, yep. So presenting to you tonight, the FY22 Norwalk Parking Authority budget, and this budget, much like all the other budgets that you're seeing, has a little bit of a, a different flow to it this year. And the budget that you saw last year was actually $7.3 million, but uh, given the parking authority's experience over the last 12 months and throughout fiscal year uh, 21, we have looked a little bit differently at the budget this year. And the budget that you see in front of you is a budget for $5.9 million for FY22. That represents an 18% decrease in the previous year's budget uh, or a decrease of $1.3 million compared to FY21. And you know the reason for this is that we're making some assumptions at the parking authority. And when I say we, I, I really mean the, the Norwalk Parking Authority in here representing them. But the parking authority um, voted to accept this budget uh, a number of weeks ago. And the reason for that is that the assumptions that are built into this budget are ones that assume a lower revenue uh, for FY22. And what that is representative of is a 70% uh, occupancy. So they're looking at 70% of the parkers using parking in the city of Norwalk as compared to FY20 um, or FY21, which was the, the previous year. So when we look at pre-COVID, we're assuming 70% of that pre-COVID number will be parking in the city of Norwalk. And we feel that that's a conservative number. Um, we've seen parking increase over the last number of months. Um, and we're very 
you know, optimistic that parking will continue to increase, especially as the weather becomes warmer and offices are coming back into um, into in-place work. So um, one of the things that I did want to note on this is that the off the revenue at 18% lower is actually offset by the expenses. And the reason for this is because we've looked at um, we've looked at that revenue number and we've been working really closely with LAS to be able to manage in an appropriate way that looks at enforcement and looks at the level of enforcement that is required uh, related to the demand in parking. And one of the things that we've seen is that we've been able to um, lower enforcement to a certain extent in order to meet that demand. Now, the great thing that we've had with the great relationship we've had with LAS over the last fiscal year is one where we've been able to reduce our enforcement in order to meet that demand. And LAS has been very active in working with us to be able to do that. So one of the things that I, I, I did want to say is that we are confident that, um, that that lower revenue number is going to come in. However, um, we have lowered expenses, but we've worked with LAS to be able to set the tone where if demand increases for parking and we need additional enforcement staff on the ground to be able to enforce the parking, we will be able to have those people join us from the LAS personnel to be able to do that. In saying all of that, um, one of the things I wanted to know, and, and the parking authority has talked a lot about this, is that this is really a, a one-time budget. This budget reduction of 5.9 million is really a one-time response to the pandemic and is not something that they anticipate moving forward. They anticipate revenue increasing year over year. Um, and you can see that in, in the budget that was sent out to you, there's a five-year projection in there, and you can see that the projection increases the budget over time um, back to levels that will reach eventually $7 million. Um, one of the things I did want to comment on was, uh, will this impact the parking experience and will this impact our ability to maintain garages and maintain the city assets? And the answer really is no. Um, and the reason for that is that we've been able to maintain the garages and actually have done a large number of improvement on the garages over the last number of years. So we are in a position where we can have a year that is a little bit of a slower year in the sense of putting out expenses to be able to maintain those facilities. But in addition to that, we also have a capital budget, budget and that capital budget supports the maintenance of the infrastructure as well. I did want to note um, just a couple of items here. One is that uh, the parking authority in the past has always provided the city with one line item that is per that reads personnel and benefits, and it's a little bit lower um, on the sheet that you have in front of you. It's expenses, but it's it's city administration expenses. There you are, a little bit lower. There we are. Um, A little bit lower, Greg, I think just um, where it says city administered. There it is right there. Okay, so you can see that personnel benefits line. So sometimes there's a little bit of confusion as to why there's two personnel benefit lines. And one of the personnel benefit lines, the one for $1.6 million, which is a decrease of 30 some odd percent, is actually the personnel that LAS provides us. It's the personnel that is the enforcement personnel that actually maintains and does the operations for the parking spaces. But the personnel number that you see here under city administered expenses, I wanted to point this out because although the Norwalk Parking Authority budget has been decreased by 18%, um, that personnel benefit number is still coming through to the city. And that's representative of the Parking Authority providing the city with expenses um, to support the actual work in which they do, right? So that would be some staff from DPW, some of the staff from TMP. It also includes a couple percentage points for um, comptroller's office as well as legal. So 
I wanted to note that it has decreased. And the reason for the uh, reduction is twofold. One is that originally we actually had parking inspectors and parking enforcement staff that were city staff members. Um, and we had all of those staff actually in City Hall at one point in time. And as they've retired or as they have moved on through attrition, we've actually not hired those positions in the city. We've actually paid, we've, uh, the parking authority has paid last for that enforcement. And um, what you see here is that we had two uh, parking enforcement officers that were with us last year. One of them took the early retirement and the other actually left Norwalk. So there's a reduction there, which means that although you see a reduction here, we haven't actually decreased any of the resources to the city in the sense of um, in the sense that that money has actually changed line items to the personnel line item that is up a little bit higher for LAS. The second thing that's happened, I think, is that with the um, early retirement, a lot of the people who were um, a lot of the positions that were being covered by this particular line item by the parking authority, those salaries have gone down. So there were a number of people in that particular line that had been with the city for a very long time and their salary was at a higher grade. And now that we've hired um, new people to fill those positions, they're at a much lower grade. So I wanted to point that out because I know that it does look quite different. And the other thing that I wanted to point out was that we do have debt service with the Norwalk Parking Authority, and this year the Parking Authority's debt service increased by 38%. And one of the things I wanted to mention to this committee is that there is a schedule that is uh, provided by the Comptroller's Office and by um, Henry's Office, uh, CFO's Office, that shows what that debt schedule is over time. And so we um, we, with the parking authority, understand what that debt schedule is. It's going to increase um, a little bit more over time, and we're aware of that. And I think I just wanted to point that out because with a budget decrease of 18% to 5.9 million, um, along with the money still coming from the parking authority to the city, and then also an increase on that debt service by 38%, I just want to make sure that um, that everyone knows that the parking authority is aware of that, and they're not concerned with being able to manage that moving forward. Uh, and I'll I'll leave it there, and I'm happy to answer any answer any questions that I know Chairman Harden is on the call as well, um, and he is happy to answer questions as well. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the parking authority? Okay, um, I guess you covered it. Great job. Thanks, thank uh, you. Um, so with that, uh, if there's no questions or comments, um, approval of the fiscal year parking authority budget, uh, council member Hooverman. Aye. Council member Keegan. Yes. Council member Sachinelli. Aye. Council member Revolus. Yes. Council member Kydes. Yes. And myself is a yes. So we will move this to the full council on Tuesday, February, oh, February, well, April 13th for full uh, council approval. So um, thank you for the presentation and um, we'll, we'll keep moving this item forward to uh, uh, full approval. Great, thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Great. Thanks everyone. Thank Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of fiscal year 2021-2022 WPCA budget. Uh, do we have a motion on this item? Council member Keegan, thank you. And we have with us Ralph Kolb, who is the senior environmental engineer for WPCA. Hello, Ralph. Hello, chairman and committee members. How, are, how is everybody tonight? Um, including the board package or what was submitted to everybody was a March 18th, 2021 memo about the WPCA operating budget, along with two pages of revenue and an expenditure um, numbers. A uh, few, few items to point out in the memo that are critical. The Norwalk Water Pollution Control Authority is an enterprise fund that manages the city's sanitary sewer collection system, pump stations, and wastewater treatment plant. On March 15th, 2021, 
the WPCA board approved a 0% sewer rate increase and uh, zero uh, registration fees for food establishments and industrial users uh, for fiscal year 21, 22. Uh, the Suez partnership has gone very well, even with COVID-19 challenges uh, in the past year. In fact, in July, 2020, only three months into the new uh, contract operating uh, contract, the wastewater treatment plant achieved its lowest ever monthly nitrogen discharge of 304 pounds per day out to the sound. And then again in 2020, or for the calendar year of 2020, we achieved the lowest all time record for nitrogen, again at 498 pounds per day. Uh, <clears throat> in regard to uh, in September of 2020, the city's CFO bonded approximately $18.5 million of new bonds to fund ongoing capital improvements uh, for our collection system, uh, pump station rehabilitation, and improvements at the wastewater treatment plant. A few key items to, to discuss on the revenues and expenditures include uh, Norwalk is, in, is looking to receive nitrogen credits in the amount of a little bit over $500,000 for 2020. Uh, final pricing or even draft pricing has not been submitted or provided by Connecticut Deep. It's based off the previous calendar year. In addition, the WPCA uh, invoices through interdepartment billing the city of Norwalk for support services that it provides to the city. That's about just over $115,000. Uh, on the expenditure side, the o and fee account for Suez includes a 3% increase and nitrogen cost sharing. Uh, they're entitled for the new service agreement if they meet certain criteria to share, uh, to share in about 25% of the nitrogen credits. There's also a line item for reimbursement of city support services. Uh, for example, finance, DPW, uh, uh, back to finance, uh, the tax collector's office, tax assessor's office, all the support services that they provide to the WPCA. And that's in the amount of about 638,000. Uh, the IT account was also increased this year to make sure that WPCA can cover the share, their share of the annual MUNIS and ESRI software fees. And looking forward, the debt service payments will increase in future years due to recent bonding. Um, I know there's been a, a lot of discussion about treatment plant capacity. And at the last BET meeting, there was some discussion about it too. The wastewater treatment plant is designed for 18 million gallons per day. In January, the WPCA staff presented to the Connecticut DEP, along with EPA and other stakeholders in Long Island Sound, our last 12 month running average is 11.6 million gallons per day. So it, with our uh, permit for the treatment plant, if we get to 90% of the design capacity, which equates to 16.2 million gallons per day, we would have to notify the state of future ways to reduce flow or increase capacity at the treatment plant. However, going back um, the last 12 months, we're under 12 million gallons per day. So for capacity wise, we have a little bit over 4 million gallons per day of, of available capacity at the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, the chairman right now has the, the, the revenue uh, page up uh, for all members to see. And then, like I said, there's one page of expenditures. Uh, for the most part, uh, with 0% increase in rates, uh, the numbers are flat. Is there any questions by the committee? Thank you, Ralph, for that presentation. Any questions or comments? Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, on this projected budget, on this budget, uh, Councilmember Hooverman. Aye. Councilmember Keegan. Yes. Councilmember Satchinelli. Aye. Councilmember Revelos. Yes. Councilmember Kaidis. Yes. And Council and myself is a yes. So. It's unanimous. So, uh, Ralph, we will move this on to for full council approval 
at next Tuesday's uh, Common Council meeting. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. Have a good night. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is the appointment of the auditors to audit fiscal year 2020 2021. And we have uh, Henry Dakowitz, our chief financial officer, to take us through that. Thank you, Chairman Burnett. Um, a year ago, we entered into an RFP. It was the end of a five year agreement with our previous auditors. And at that time we had selected Bloom Shapiro. Um, they did an outstanding job this first year. The only change is that they have merged with a national firm. And I keep forgetting their acronym of three letters, but uh, Chitsume could probably help me here. Um, CLA, right? Clifton Larson Associates? Correct. Yes, okay. I have too many three letter agencies to deal with. Um, but they've done an outstanding job. And in fact, Clifton Larson has designated Bloom Shapiro to manage their whole New England region for the national firm. Um, we're very pleased. We're excited about working with them again next year. And we appreciate the reappointment. I should just mention, we entered into a five-year contract with them. Um, so to me, unless unless they do something awful, but in fact, they've been terrific to work with. No, no reason to change. Changing auditors is not something you wanna do unless you absolutely have to. Right. Okay. Um, any questions or comments on the audit? Is there, yes. is there a cost associated with this contract? Yeah, the cost is a five-year contract. It goes up a couple of thousand every year. Okay. I think this past year was 95,000. 95. I, I don't have the details right in front of me, but the back of my head says it goes up by about 2,500 a year. Um, that is a good point. So as we move this on to the council, um, we should probably include what this year's audit costs will be. Okay, I mean, it's recommended to implement as as per the original contract, which includes all those. The original contract shows the, yeah, so, yeah, okay. Yes. So, it's yeah, specified, so. yes. Yeah, okay. Any other comments or questions? Sorry, just a correction. What, what year in the contract are we right now? We just finished fiscal year. Okay, let me get the years right. For our fiscal year that ended June 30 of 2020, we conducted an audit. They normally do the audit from July 1st through December 31st when they issued the report. That was the first year of the five-year contract. So what we're discussing is year two, which would be an audit of this year's financials conducted in fiscal year 22. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sure. Great. So with that, um, vote on the auditor continuing to use um, the acronym, the new name for Bloom Shapiro. Um, Council Member Hooverman. Aye. Council Member Keegan. Yes. Council Member Sacinelli. Aye. Council Member Revolus. Yes. Council Member Kaides. Yes. And myself is a yes, so it's unanimous. So and we will move this on to the full council for uh, council meeting on next Tuesday um, for full council approval. Thank you. That moves us to the uh, final item on the agenda, which is the chief financial officer's fiscal year 2020 operating budget update. And um, I'll share my screen to bring up the um, Okay, Henry. Thank you. Um, yeah, if we could go up a little, could you get to the bottom of that page also? No, we're gonna have to do it in two parts. Okay, let's go up to the top. We'll just do the expenditures. So right now, and we have the columns there. Um, 
just to remind myself because the operating budget and the capital budget changes responsibility. For the operating budget, the, the Common Council sets a cap, a ceiling on the expenditures, and then the Board of Estimate and Taxation reviews it, can allocate and make changes from department to department and where those dollars get spent or authorized as long as they don't exceed the budget, uh, the cap. If they do, they may have to come back to the council and request an increase. Um, what we decided to do with the funds from the American Recovery Act, which we are expecting. Uh, the mayor has decided to take those funds and to use them to offset the increases so that the taxpayers will have a flat tax bill from last year to this year. Um, at the same time, uh, my recommended budget was a 2% increase for the Board of Education. Um, we have recommended and the Board of Estimate approved a 0% increase for the Board of Education since they will be getting their own $27 million allocation in the American Recovery Act funds. And we have had discussions with them for them to utilize those funds in exchange for the increase that was originally budgeted. So that's the major change that has occurred in this middle column. So last year's budget was 385.6 million of expenditures. My recommended budget was 400.6 million. We're now sitting at 396.6. So the city departments were kept where they were and the $4 million increase that was originally designated to the Board of Education was removed, dropping the total to 396.6 million. Um, the council had asked, had set a cap of 399.5 million. So obviously this comes in below that cap and satisfies their requirements. Uh, Greg, if you could just go up the screen a little bit more so we can show the bottom. Thank you. So now this is what I call the bottom below the line, below the expenditure. So we're at 396.6 million. Um, we have the elderly tax relief program, other programs, tax appeals, we call those the tax adjustments of $4.6 million. Reserve for uncollected, if you recall last year, we reduced it to 97.6% because we thought with COVID, we weren't sure what the collections would look like and we tried to be conservative. And for this coming year, we put that back to the 98.6%. That was a historical rate. Uh, but that change alone uh, re, uh, increased the amount that we had to collect by three and a half million dollars. Um, other tax revenues, we have back tax and supplemental 5.6 million. And in the non-tax revenue section, there's a line item for intergovernmental. And that is, you'll see a change in the fourth column from the left. 11.956 million. That is the money from the American Recovery Act that we intend to apply to the budget so that when we get to the net tax levy, we also have the fund balance transfer, instead of reducing it by $8 million, we're keeping it flat. So we're looking at a net tax levy of $352.5 million, a little bit higher than last year. And with our grand list, the average mill rate last year was 23.875. This year, 23.904, an increase of 0.03 mills, 0.1%. We should note one of the major requirements of the American Recovery Act is that the funds are not permitted to be used 
to reduce taxes. We understand we are allowed to keep the taxes flat, but not to reduce them beyond where they were last year. And that's how we came up with this average mill rate. Do we have more pages? And here we go into how that translates into mill rates by district. So this top box, the top rectangle, shows our current fiscal year 2022 tentative approved budget, where the Board of Ed is getting a 0% increase, and we're using 12.9 million of the American Recovery Act proceeds. So you have the mill rates, and what we do here is we calculate what the costs are for fire, garbage, lighting, and we then allocate them to the districts that obtain those services and then pay for them. And that's how we get our district mill rates. So as you see, the first, the second and third are all 23.968 because they get the same services, fire and garbage included. The fourth uh, is Seward. They also pay for lighting, 24.054. The fifth, there's no garbage, that's 23.621. The sixth, um, in that district, they tell us what they charge their residents, we collect it, and that's a 22.166. The, the grid on the bottom, the rectangle, that shows you um, how that translates into tax bills. So the medium home values where we're using um, the data that we've recovered, uh, that we've obtained from the assessor, and the numbers for the average median home value has remained the same. And so for the fiscal year 21 approved budget, the average tax bill based on that assessed value is going from 5762 up to 16963 for the sixth district. And for the tentative approved, you notice very similar numbers. The third line shows you the increase or decrease. Um, we're looking at a, a reduction, $6, $3, an increase in the third district of three, $18 in the fourth, $2 in the fifth, and 12 in the sixth. Again, because of rounding and formulas, we can't get it precise by district. What we did is for the city as a whole. So conceptually, we took the budget and said, we can apply these funds to give the greatest good to the most number of people. We wanted all the taxpayers in Norwalk to benefit. We took all the increases that were uh, agreed upon by the council and the board of estimate and just use these funds we're getting from the federal government to keep those tax bills flat. I'm happy to answer any questions. Council member Hoover. Um, questions and, and comment. Um, I, I appreciate the need and the sentiment about uh, keeping the taxes flat and reasonable. Um, but I, I'm concerned about a couple of things. And one is that I know that the ARPA money is, it's a two years, but are they're gonna, they're gonna, you, it's gonna dole out in two, increments over two years, which I think is going to hit us in both in, in the same fiscal year. Uh, it's, and it's, it's two calendar years. It's two calendar because they do it on the calendar year and it crosses into, it hits us basically all in, in, in 22, in fiscal year 22, because you're going to get money in 21 and money in 22, correct? And that's, but it's going to fall in our fiscal year. Well, uh, actually the first money should be coming in a month, which would be in this fiscal year. Oh, okay. All right. So I, I, I mean, we know the money, we're identifying it and we'll be using it uh, in a very purposeful way. Okay, that's, the, the, that's fine. So the, my, my, my point is this, we're, by using this money, we're sort of saying to the Board of Ed, you need to use this money and use it operationally over the course of the next two years. Now, my question is keeping taxes flat right now, don't we set ourselves up for a cliff in 24? Well, 
Well, I'm, I'm that we're going to have to that we're going to have to deal with. And if we deal with some of it in 23, we're still going to have to deal with the majority of it in 24, because these expenses are going to in the city side as well. So the expenses are going to continue to grow. We're well, going to grow. Let, let me make sure I understand. Originally, two, three weeks ago, we were talking about giving the Board of Ed a $4 million increase. They're getting $27 million. We're asking them to use $4 million instead of us paying that $4 million. We don't tell them how to use the $23 million. That's their choice on how they use it. Now, the funds are designed specifically, as the mayor has pointed out, one of the major purposes of the funds is to avoid layoffs. So those funds are to be used by the Board of Ed based on the needs that they identify. And in this case, compensating for the fact that we want to keep the taxes flat. Um, you're right. If they start new programs, if they start hiring people that they pay for with these funds in the next two years, then Obviously, they're going to ask for a lot more money three years from now and say, we need to pay for our personnel costs and the salary increases. I think what we're trying to do on the city is not initiate new programs, but to pay for things where we don't have the funding, where we might have been, um, we might have had lost revenue because of COVID. So that's what we're trying to do. We're not using this to expand the frontier to add all these new programs. We have $140 million of capital projects that we haven't bonded for. We've just passed another capital pro program. The capital project uh, will be coming in the next couple of weeks. So the reality is the needs have been identified. And this is a wonderful um, one-time program that helps us fund all of these worthy programs that have been debated, discussed, and approved. I think the biggest risk is if the Board of Education uses these funds to expand and initiate all these new programs, yes, if they're not temporary two-year programs, at the end of the two years, they're gonna to come to us and ask for more money. And I think that's risky. I think if they use it to pay for certain things that maybe haven't gotten funded or to help supplement their budgets or supplement their grants, then this is just a positive and helps us achieve our mission with extra dollars that we're receiving. But the 20% of the, of the ARPA money is supposed to, what, in my, what I've been reading about is supposed to, is to address the problems with learning loss. And we've, we've, we've had a huge amount of learning loss uh, in, the, in this last year. And going into, into the 21-22 school year, we're, we're going to need, to, they're, the, 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 they're gonna need to add staff in order to help get back these kids and get them back up to speed. And so, we're we're looking at at without helping from a budgetary standpoint and allowing that money to be utilized for that, but saying that the money needs to go, you know, you've got to pay for operational expenses or things that you haven't done. I'm concerned that we're setting ourselves up for a very large tax increase in fiscal year 24, because they're going to need to continue that path that's being started now. And that's my concern right now, that, that by keeping taxes flat right now, that we set ourselves up for this cliff. And that if we're not looking ahead incrementally, that that you know, we could be in a situation in two years where we're talking about a very large tax increase. And I'm concerned about that. I think the comment you just made, David, is, 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 is spot on and by saying we have to look ahead and we have to start looking ahead now and not wait two years from now to say, now, what is the situation and how do we address it? So while we're receiving this windfall of, of dollars, we need to start thinking about ahead now and putting a strategy, strategy in place now. That, that's exactly what we need to do. And Chairman Burnett, I'd, I'd like to also add that, you know, the, and this is something that we've we've spoken about before here. It's been spoken in other committees that that I think this is the the opportunity where we're looking at the potential of this cliff and looking at this, that we need to start to open this dialogue to to get this 
us them thing that's been going on and start to work towards eliminating that on on a number of levels not just through finance through facilities through through all the areas where we touch in commonality and i think that we need to take this as an opportunity so that we don't get to fiscal year 24 and end up in a situation where it it becomes a a, a slog and a dog fight to try to figure out how we're going to pay for this and that's that's the point that I'm, i want to make so and the, and the first step is really moving forward on the efficiency study yes that, that's and and we're 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 moving that forward and that's going to provide an enormous amount of data points that we can use to have these strategic planning sessions about what it will look like a year from now two years from now so that that's a very important thing we need to use uh, council member Sessionelli. No, you, you beat me to it. I just wanted to, to remind the group uh, in a similar way that we do, we are moving forward with the efficiency study. And for the first time, we'll have some data points to draw from and understand where we have maybe potentially unnecessary overhead or where we might need to align additional resources. So I think that's going to be very useful in, in, in the coming months and years. Okay. Uh, any other comments, thoughts? Um, uh, I, I think it's refreshing to know that the Board of Ed will receive $27 million that they can plan appropriately to use over the course of the next uh, two years. Um, that will help them, or it will help our students, I should say. It will help the taxpayers because we can keep year to year taxes down, if not totally flat going forward now and going forward. Um, but clearly, yes, we have to begin planning for the future now. We, we can't, it would be totally irresponsible if we don't and, and, and we fall off that cliff two, three years from now. And, and it, that cliff will fall on the backs of the taxpayers. And we cannot allow that to happen. Okay, um, this item is, is so, so basically going forward, um, we will have this item on the council agenda as a review, not a approval because we are not adjusting the cap. The BET came in below the cap. So the cap can, that the council approved, that number will remain the same because the BET came in under the cap and uh, we could move forward with uh, our cap, you know, our cap recommendation that we approved staying in, intact. And um, the BET can then go forward in terms of formally um, uh, advertising the mill rate for each of the districts based upon the cap that we approved. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, if there's no other questions or comments, um, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. All those in favor, show by a sign of I, raise your hand. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Um, appreciate everyone's input. And um, we'll go forward from here. Have a good rest of the evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.